Hello everybody, a very warm welcome to Talking Business Weekly with me, Aaron Heselhurst. Let's go and take a look at what's on the show. A demographic time bomb. The global life expectancy has doubled in just over 100 years. But it's not all good news. What does our rapidly aging population mean for societies and our wider economy? In some places, there's a growing imbalance between an increasing older generation and a birth rate that seems to have fallen off a cliff. It means paying for healthcare and welfare is one of the biggest challenges facing governments all around the world. But this older generation, it represents a huge commercial opportunity. So how do businesses capitalize on the silver consumer? I'm gonna be discussing all of that with these two. There they are. Professor Jane Falkingham is director of the Center for Population Change and Dr. Joe Coughlin, who's the big boss at the MIT Age Lab in Boston. Also on the show, I'm joined by the big boss of Moleskin. Yep, yeah, the luxury accessories company still providing beautifully bound notebooks to every generation. After three years at the helm, Daniela Riccardi is going to tell us how the business is adapting to the changing demand for stationery. Wherever you're joining me from around the world, once again, a big hello and a warm welcome to the show. Three score years and ten. What's that? Well, it's an ancient biblical number expressing a, a typical healthy human lifespan, 70 years. But it was only in 2010 when the global life expectancy finally passed that number. You know, an average baby born today should now expect to live to 73. It's near enough doubled in 100 years. But of course, that figure hides big variations. Girls, they should expect to live a few years longer than boys. Wealthier people tend to be healthier as well. On the whole, they live longer lives. Naturally, you see disparities between rich countries and poor. Here's how global life expectancy has changed since 1950. In Japan, it's now approaching 85 years old. In the United States, it's about 80. And it's close to that, 79, in China. In India, the world's most populous nation, it's 72 years old. And in sub-Saharan Africa, it's generally much lower. In fact, in the Central African nation of Chad, one of the world's poorest countries, the life expectancy there is just under 54 years old. And that, tragically, is a country where one in 10 children die before their fifth birthday. But life expectancy is improving near enough everywhere. And that presents, well, huge challenges, but also huge opportunities for those of us living much longer than our ancestors. I can see why we worry about an aging society. It seems to be a fundamentally good thing. We have to mourn fewer children. We mourn the passing of fewer parents in middle age, and we get to see more grandparents and even great grandparents meet their grandchildren. That's a great thing. And I think if we can exploit that age diversity and really make most of those intergenerational relationships, that's a real positive. And of course, if underneath we can make these longer lives, not just longer, but healthier, and more productive for longer, they also create the economic resources necessary to, to pay for this longer life. But some societies, they're struggling to cope with these big demographic changes. I mentioned Japan. With the world's oldest life expectancy, Japan also has the world's highest proportion of elderly citizens. The birth rate there is low, so is immigration. So there are big questions about how to pay for social and health care for tens of millions of older people. There's a similar issue in South Korea. Its proportion of elderly people is expected to surpass that of Japan in the years ahead. The birth rate has been falling since 1960 and the population is now in decline. It's expected to fall by half in the decades ahead. China's one-child policy was closed down back in 2016, but the birth rate remains low, especially as more and more women want to enjoy careers in the big cities. The ageing society is well underway in Italy, and women are having fewer children. Governments there are offering financial incentives to have bambinos, and a quarter of women have none at all. There's a growing reliance on young migrants to bolster that workforce. In some parts of the sub-Saharan Africa, falling infant mortality means a growing number of today's children will grow old. A bulging elderly population is to be expected in the years to come. 
Many countries are increasing their pension age, of course, to keep people working and paying taxes for longer. Here in the UK, an 18-year-old entering the job market today should expect to retire at 68 or possibly even older. In France, President Macron, he recently raised his country's pension age from 62 to 64. But boy, it triggered months of protests and riots. Those reforms are being phased in from this month until the year 2030. So, my first guest is a specialist researcher in demography and international social policy at the University of Southampton, and she's also director of the Centre for Population Change at the Economic and Social Research Council. Professor Jane Falkingham, a real pleasure having you on the show. And Jane, let's start with this, because global life expectancy, it's rising. On the face of it, like, that's great news, right, for individuals or for families. But, Jane, I'm just wondering, what kind of societal challenges does it pose? It's fantastic news that life expectancy is rising, and it's rising right across the globe. Um, but, of course, it does have challenges with more people living longer. Um, one of the things is we've got more people living now into their 70s, 80s, 90s and even into their hundreds. Life expectancy is why we as individuals are living longer, but actually it's falling birth rates, which is why societies as a whole are, are ageing. We have fewer people of working age to support m more people of older ages. And of course that then presents challenges in terms of how do we take care of those older people, their health, their... their um, well-being at home, and also um, their incomes, pensions. I think it's one of the biggest challenges. Probably the changing age structure of our populations and, and, um, and climate change are probably the two biggest challenges I think we're, we're facing. Which countries find themselves most exposed to health care or, or welfare risk as, as a result of these ageing populations? The countries in the world which have the highest proportions of older people are those in, in the global north. But it's taken us quite a long time to get there. So uh, in France, the population went from 7% aged 65 to 14%, a doubling, and it took 115 years. So policymakers and planners had a pretty long time to plan that. That same transition has now just taken place uh, in Japan and it took 26 years. So that's really not a lot of time to plan for changes in your population age structure. I want to look at sub-Saharan Africa, Jane, because the life expectancy there, it, it's rising rapidly as well, but these are countries where it's approaching 65 instead of 85 in Nigeria or Chad. I mean, the life expectancy there is still in the mid-50s. Life expectancy in sub-Saharan Africa is still quite uh, low because they still have relatively high infant and child mortality rates. But if you get beyond say age five or six, then actually your life expectancy is now starting to run into the 60s and 70s. And I've done some work in the slums of uh, Nairobi with colleagues in, uh, in, uh, in Kenya, and um, there are old people living in the slums in Nairobi. What measures can countries take to, to adapt to the challenges posed by these ageing societies? I mean, if we look at healthcare in particular, how can that be made, well, affordable when the call on healthcare, one would assume it's going to be dominated by the very old? We know from research in, in the Global North that the most expensive year in terms of healthcare is the year uh, immediately before you, you pass away. So, first of all, that's a, a big thing, is to actually introduce more preventative health care. And then, actually, I think we need to start having probably a grown-up debate around end-of-life and end-of-life care. So, um, in countries such as the, ne the Netherlands now, actually, people can make the decision to have a, an, an assisted suicide and a, an, a good death, so a good life followed by a good death. Jane, let's talk about the costs of pension bills, because in the past, you know, pensions were a liability to, to be paid out for, for two or five years. But now, many people are living decades into retirement. Surely, that's unsustainable. Well, there are a number of different levers that you can pull with, with pensions. So the first of those is the age at which uh, people start to take their pensions. So a lot of countries are looking at raising their age of retirement. So um, taking my own example, for example, I, when I started work in the 1980s, the retirement age for women was 60. 
It's now 67 and it's going to be going up even higher. The second tool is to then think about actually uh, who's contributing to pensions as well. And we've seen a massive change in uh, the labour market over the last 30 years, uh, particularly with women, so increasing female labour force. And then the third uh, tool that uh, governments have, and, and businesses as well, is to think about the structure of those pensions. So to what extent are they related to uh, uh, your, your salary uh, in terms of defined benefit or whether they're contributory pensions. Jane, how do you see national workforces changing in the, in the years ahead? We're already starting to see that, uh, that workforces are becoming older, particularly in the global north. In, in the global south, of course, they've still got uh, fairly young uh, populations. But in the north, we're seeing uh, a shift of the age of the workforce upwards. And I think employers are now starting to think about, well, what does that mean? How do they reskill uh, their workforce, um, lifelong training uh, initiatives? And also they need to start to think about uh, the other demands that are placed on people uh, as they become uh, older. If you look at your 50s and 60s, you're starting to care for your older parents. You're, you may be caring for your grandchildren to enable your children to start participating in the labour market. And, of, and you're working. So how do we balance off all of these uh, different roles and responsibilities? And I think employers are starting to recognise that they need to be a little bit more family friendly, uh, introducing carers leave and, and things like that. And let me end on this, Jane. I mean, are you hopeful? I mean, there's some really big challenges ahead for some of these economies that we've been discussing. How are we going to navigate this reality of living longer so that it actually becomes an opportunity and, and not a burden? We're living at a particular moment in human history where populations are being reshaped. So for the last million, two million, three million years, populations have been shaped like a pyramid with a few people at the top ages and then most people at the bottom ages. We're reshaping, so we're moving from a pyramid to a skyscraper. And in, in a couple of hundred years time, that would just be completely normal. So we're actually just going to have to come up uh, with uh, a new way of thinking about things. Well, on that point, Professor Jane Falkingham, a real pleasure having you on the show. Thanks for joining me and we'll check in with you soon. Lovely to be with you. Well, the work of my next guest explores how well, global demographics, technology and changing behaviours are transforming business and society. He's the big boss of Age Lab at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology at the MIT. He's also the author of The Longevity Economy. He's been an advisor to several multinational companies and even the White House. Dr. Joseph Coughlin, a real pleasure having you on the show. And uh, I know you like to go by Joe. So, Joe, let's start with this, because we've just been hearing from one of my other guests, a demographer, who's explained the societal challenges of ageing populations. But, but, Joe, I want to know, what are the challenges that you see, especially for businesses? Frankly, there are many challenges, but longevity or ageing population should also be looked at as an amazing opportunity. We've never had this many older people, and frankly, living this long and this well. So some of the challenges, however, are what will they want? How do we keep them engaged? How do we maintain productivity in an aging world? These are not just challenges, but they're global opportunities as well. We're now in an era when people who do retire in their 60s are, are often still very healthy. How are businesses reacting to that ever-growing class of, of consumer? I want you to imagine this, the 60 plus consumer worldwide is the third largest global economy in the world after the GDP of the US and China. And yet they only get on average two to 3% of the advertising dollar. Some of the things that business can do to respond to this amazing market that is growing worldwide is to actually start looking at them as a market, doing more research to understand the amazing diversity in the aging population. This is not your grandfather's old age. This is the most educated, best income that we've ever seen in an older population in history. Start understanding that most older adults do not want to buy or wear anything that says old man walking or old man about to fall down. Largely, we want products that, shall we say, help us age by stealth, whether it's the, the Apple Watch that has a motion detector that can tell whether or not you've fallen and can't get up, whether it's 
uh, products like Honda's Element or Renault's Twingo that are easy to get into and have easy to read dashboards that are made for young kids, but older adults like it too. Or frankly, even Dyson vacuums and hair dryers that are designed with elegance and great color but are very light and easy to put over your head or, or vacuum the floor. What are the barriers or some of the barriers uh, for, for businesses fighting to, to exploit the aging marketplace? Probably the greatest barrier for business and frankly, society in general is the story of old age. Business, like many of us, unfortunately, continues to believe that, you know, those older people, they don't buy anything new or they're not willing to change brands, or they're, they're set in their ways, or the big myth, they don't like technology. These beliefs are actually keeping them from innovating things that excite and delight the most lucrative, largest, fastest growing market in the world. And by the way, you may find it fun that the catalyst to this innovation and in the longevity economy are women. Indeed, in the longevity economy, the future is female. Joe, we've seen retirement ages you know, creeping up in, in, in many countries and, and especially to try and control the soaring costs of paying out for pensions for decades. How will that affect businesses accommodating more workers in their, well, in their late 60s, maybe even into their 70s and their 80s? These workers, shall we say, have the skills that make the business do what it does. They have the memory of why businesses uh, do certain things and not others. And frankly, in many cases, they even have the contacts with the clients that keep things going. But business is going to have to rethink things like flexibility, rethinking promotion. And older workers are going to have to appreciate that just because you've been on the job for 30 or 40 plus years does not necessarily mean you continue to get paid 30 or 40 plus years the same way. I'm also wondering now, what do older workers, Joe, and younger workers have in common in the workplace nowadays? You know, we'd like to believe that there's this generational conflict out there. In fact, one of the things that's emerging since the pandemic in particular is a convergence of ideals. So younger workers want flexibility largely for quality of life. Older workers want flexibility for quality of life as well as jobs like caregiving or, or transitioning down. Younger workers want to be trained and kept up on the, on the up-to-date technologies and processes. Older workers that have been in the workplace for 20, 30, 40 years also want training and education to make the business case that they can remain in the workplace. So we're seeing a convergence, not a divergence. What about us, Joe, you and I? I mean, given a, a fair wind, we might hope for, for more healthy years than our ancestors. H how do we make the most of that? You know, you have to think about this, that uh, the average retirement age and period that we call retirement today uh, is going to likely be the same amount of time as it took you to get from 21 years old to midlife crisis, 46, 47 years old. So think about the time, the diversity, the experiences you had during that period. Now we're looking from 65 to 85 and change being a full 8,000 days or one third, if you will, of your adult life. What we have to do is we have to start writing a new story of old age. It has to be more than golf, beach walks, and please let it be more than pickleball. Let's talk about paying for it because, Joe, you know, we're, st we're staring in the face of enormous pension bills and we have to save for that. A and for the probability, there's no guarantee of that longer life. Some of us could save hundreds of thousands, possibly a million dollars for retirement uh, in our working lives. And by a cruel stroke of fate, we may end up not seeing a penny of it. I mean, and yet we, but we have to save aggressively, yeah? Yes, we have to save aggressively. And unfortunately, most of us are not. We have to start thinking not just about whether our health wealth span will, shall we say, coincide with our lifespan. We also have to start thinking about what are we going to do with that time? Where will we live? What will we do? Some of the things we may want to think about for people like you and I that effectively get paid by running off at the mouth or driving a keyboard is we may choose and may uh, need to work longer. What I worry about are the people that work with their bodies, the bricklayers, the truck drivers. Those are the folks where retirement was truly made for them because by 50 something, your body begins to give out. And Joe, let me end on this, because this trend of aging has been ongoing for some time, essentially since the, well, the Industrial Revolution. How long might it continue? How old do you, do you think we'll get to in the, in the future? 
I think that we are are going to continue to see things where where 100 is going to be the new norm. Let me leave you with this. Some research indicates that children born already in the last 20 years, one half of them only in the industrialized world, but hopefully expanding beyond that, one half of those children will make it past 100 and change. The challenge now is not just to live longer, but how do we live better? Well, on that point, Dr. Joseph Coughlin, the, the big boss of MIT Age Lab, really appreciate your time. Thanks for joining me and I'll, I'll talk to you soon. Real delight, take care. Let's talk luxury now because my next guest is the big boss of Moleskin. That's the Italian accessories company notable for its beautiful stationary products, its bags and gifts. She's been running the company since April of 2020, just as the COVID pandemic was hammering society everywhere. Prior to Moleskin, she also led some other big brands, such as Diesel and Baccarat. Daniela Riccardi, a real pleasure having you on the show. And Daniela, let me start with this, because we've been talking on, on this show about the ageing society, basically how, how more and more of us are living longer into, into retirement. I'm just wondering, is this something that Moleskin is addressing a, a, as you look out into the marketplace? I, I'm also wondering, is there an opportunity for you to target, as they call them, the, the silver consumer? Thank you. Uh, this is a, a beautiful question. <laughs> um, the, I, I think Moleskin, you know, as uh, one of the beauty of Moleskin, that uh, is a brand that live with you uh, for your life. Uh, is the is the place where you treasure and you record uh, all your life. So most of our consumers and clients uh, are really aficionado. They start when you're young and they keep going until the end of their life. A lot of people give it as a gift to senior people, to this silver client, as you call it. I actually call them golden clients because they are the ones that have been with us the longest. And, and it's beautiful for them uh, to be able to continue to record uh, the journey of their life. So um, our, our most uh, beloved clients. And Daniela, we know you sell a range of luxury products. I'm just I'm just wondering, how are you finding the current economic climate? Is it having a big impact on, on the business? I'm sure like the luxury sector is probably the most resilient during crisis time. So um, the brands, I think, that have a, a strong standing, a strong heritage, a strong credibility, like I'm lucky to, to be on Moleskine, I have actually chosen also for that because I like real brands, brands that are built to last. The same was for Baccarat, you know, over 250 years. Imagine how many crises that brand went through, how many wars and economic crises, and still the, the resilience of the brand was pretty incredible. Other is, of course, you know, the luxury consumers is less affected by economic difficulties than other consumers. Has the, the war in Ukraine had any impact on you? I'm just wondering, do, does Moleskine still sell in, in Russia? We don't sell uh, directly in Russia. We don't have our own operation on the grounds. Uh, but, you know, we, we, as a principle, we don't discriminate clients uh, and consumers. So I'm sure that there are uh, many Russians that are still using and buying Moleskine um, and have access to the brand. Um, in Ukraine, of course, the situation is very difficult, but uh, we have been uh, sending a lot of moleskin, um, blue and yellow moleskins, particularly for children. And Daniela, as we know, more and more people, and it's not just the young people, we're using uh, tablets, we're using laptops, etc., et to get work done. Do you see technology as a a major competitor to your brand? Moleskin was created in the 90s uh, by three friends, uh, Italian friends, and they created it with the idea of uh, a, a Moleskin uh, to be the companion of a technology device. So in fact, we know that the combination of <clears throat> a dry tick, a sketch tick, and then bringing everything on the digital platform offer the best possibility of, uh, in the process of idea creations and, and creativity in general. And we know that Moleskin, it's a, you know, you're a global company. You, you've got very strong European roots, of course, but I'm just wondering, Daniela, do you, do you see cultural differences in your business ar around the world? 
I have to tell you when it gets to uh, and writing and sketch and sketching um, and drawing, we see about the same uh, uh, behaviors all over the world. Um, we have a pretty big business in the USA. We have business in Latin America. We have business in Asia. Japanese, Chinese are very fun. Uh, I think of drawing, of calligraphy, of journaling. So the state of the development of our business depends on uh, the fact that we started in Europe first and we went to the US and we went to Asia last. But from a consumer acceptance and consumer behavior point of view, I have to say we see about the same dynamic everywhere in the world. And Daniela, let me end, let me end on this. What would you like the future of moleskin to to look like? The mission we have of unleashing the human genius through pen to paper, because this is an important part of the human capital that we don't have to lose it. So uh, the most important is really understand the power that there is into uh, using um, uh, pen to paper. We are a clearly respected uh, brand for our story, for our heritage. And you know, uh, 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 I, I want to, we want to show and empower people. So showing what uh, the, the, the importance of uh, unleashing the creativity. Well, on that point, Daniela Riccardi, the big boss of Mobile Skin, really appreciate your time. Thanks for joining me. Good luck with everything. And we'll talk to you again soon. Thank you. Thank you. Well, that's it for this week's show. I hope you enjoyed it. Don't forget, you can keep up with the latest on our global economy on the BBC website or the smartphone app. Of course, you can also follow me on X. X me. I'll X you back. You can get me a BBC Aaron. Thanks for watching. I'll see you soon. Bye-bye.